podcast, and I'm joined by one of the stars of Netflix's hit show, The Three Bi- Problem, Javon Adepo. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, man. This is, this is a pleasure. You know, let's just get right into it. Uh, Three Body Problem, a very famous Chinese novel by Lu Shijin, uh, now being brought to American audiences. Was it something you were familiar with? Was it just, you know, your agent slides you a script and it's Benny Off and Weiss are involved and you're like, I'm in. I don't care what the project is. I'm just going to be a part of it. How, what was the process? Yeah, you just said it, it was the latter. Um, I gotten the uh, the email from my agents um, and I was already filming uh at the moment I was I was finishing Babylon uh, and I had gotten the notice and, and saw what the job was. It was untitled at the time, but it said, uh, you know, Benioff, Weiss and Wu. And I was like, oh, right away, I would love to have an opportunity to have a meeting with these guys to talk about uh, the world that they're trying to create and, and see if through the casting process that I'm, I'm a right fit for the role. So um, to answer your, your first question, I was not familiar with the, with the book beforehand, um, but after I, I met them in LA at their offices, I got the book, took a stab at it or took a swing at it and missed because it is so dense, it's such a thick book. The material is so dense that it took me two passes to get through it and to really try to keep um, keep track of what's going on with all of these characters. Uh, the second time being through audio books. So every time I was going on <laughs> yeah. for Babylon, I was able to listen to the story. But um, I was really interested at the prospect of being a part of this just because, like you said, I mean, these are heavy hitters. Uh, in, in in storytelling, and so I wanted to do anything I could to uh, to be a part of this of this project, and uh, yeah, it was an exciting prospect, and I'm glad that I got a chance to do it. Yeah, no, uh, one of my dear friends, he's really a big reader, so when I was watching the series, he's read the book, one of the few oh, people God. I know, so like I was asking him questions, I was like, is this matching, you know, um, because like you mentioned, it's very dense, it's got this Perfect. very, he describes to me the cerebral intelligence to it where you know not everything's entirely action it's through like intense physics and mathematics and through a scientist mind so i just i'm curious you know compare this to something like watchmen you know something that exists as a franchise but with such a loose adaptation you had some more freedoms as a performer in interpreting that story for this did you feel a bit more um obligated to stick to the script to you know be more dedicated to the material just because you wanted to get it right well, I think we definitely uh, had a bit of a, um, I would say, a, uh, I think we had a bit of an advantage as actors because Benioff, or I, I should say dad, David, Alex, and Dan, um, what we call yeah. them dad, because it was easier than saying all the names, but we refer to them as dad, um, because they had done all of the work adapting the characters and adapting the story to, to screen. And I think some of the concepts or most of the concepts that are shared in the books uh, are so complex that it's tricky to be able to find a way to mm. adapt it to screen and in a way that's that the consumer can or mass consumers can can attempt to understand. Um, so I think yeah. that they did most of the heavy lifting for us. We were very fortunate to have that because the conversation then became, how do we as actors collaborate with you guys to to bring the characters that you put on paper so brilliantly, but they also allowed us to kind of put our own uh, ideas into it as well as where where it was where it was fitting um as yeah. much as i can if it's on the paper if it's on the page i like to kind of stay on board with what the writers put there because they put it there for a reason and they've done mm-hmm. so much and such great things in storytelling that you want to trust what they're creating uh but they it was refreshing that they allowed us to kind of put our own quirks in and when i say us i mean oxford five and all the uh my other brilliant castmates to do things that were fun kind of loose wherever they saw fit so it was it was a pretty in my recollection uh a pretty seamless um process as far as conversations with those guys going through the casting process pre-production and then going in day to day on set and and doing these scenes yeah you mentioned the other cast um I want to ask what's it like working with them because, you know, Saul or Saul Duran in, in this English adaptation of it mm-hmm. um, from his, you know, tiny counterpart, um, you know, someone who doesn't fully live up to his quote unquote potential, mm-hmm. he's aloof to a degree and the relationships he has. Uh, how does that play as a performer into developing those dynamics, especially with your relationships with Augie, you know, Isaac Gonzalez is amazing and, and the character of Will, of course, in that friendship. Right. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really come to to admire Saul as a person. Uh, it's in a, in a weird way because playing him was a bit difficult for me initially, because, like you said, he is so much more 
on the on the standoffish or silent type of individual compared to his other brilliant counterparts. I think all of these guys have all done great things for uh, for the for the the science uh, you know the science world, and he has the capability to do so in a major way. But he's just never done that. And even in the early episodes, uh, when we first start to establish the game and the headset, and you know the terrors that are haunting physicists around the world, everybody has such strong opinions about it. And they're trying, and there's a lot of conflicting ideas and, and all of the, you know, the Oxford Five, everybody's kind of handling different things in different ways. And it's it's kind of a task to for Saul to be able to be somebody that just sits back. And I always thought that it was like, oh, well, he's just kind of being boring and he's kind of just uh, deciding to ignore everything and kind of not care. But I think a lot of the time, people who are the quietest are the ones that are spending time listening. Um, even when we're thinking about, I don't know if this is spoiler friendly, but when they first really as a group uh, kind of face the the realities of the VR headset and they're all at Jack's house and they're all bickering about what they think this means for physicists and why they're, as, as, Will, as Will would say, topping themselves, killing themselves. And mm -hmm. they spend five, 10 minutes, everybody going back and forth about what's the right way to attack this until they're like, okay, what is this effing VR headset? What does it mean? What is the relevance of it? And then they basically are like, okay, boy genius, so give us something that we can use. And that's something that's really admirable, I think, because he is one of the most brilliant minds in the world, but he's the quietest. So it's like, what is it about his brilliance and his talent that he's so afraid of that he just actively chooses in every day of his life that translates to this entire season, he just chooses to sit back and do nothing. Is there a fear of failure? Is there a trauma of, of him, you know, never living up to expectations from his parents or whatever. There's so much about him that I've tried to fill that we don't get to see on screen, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm hoping that um, that Saul will get to uh, express more of that in the event that we get to uh, continue to tell his story uh, in future seasons. You know, it feels very much into that like archetype of like when you people think of really intelligent individuals and these theoretical doctors and geniuses of like the torture genius and you know what's going on it, the way they interact with people are so different because of what is truly processing it, right. it plays so well into Saul's eventual arc you know him starting to realize he needs to step up more seeing the tolls it's starting to take him becoming right. you know, a part of the wall facer program what was it like to Absolutely. see that you know so you know we, we touched on spoilers let's go into it you know uh that natural evolution of that and seeing how it tips off and sets off what could be happening for the next season i, th I think it's awesome man because in the earlier episodes What's really cool is that, like, he's a physicist. It's been established that he's very intelligent. You know, they say, oh, you're Vera's favorite, yada, yada, yada. But he's such a relatable guy. And it's been put on paper. And, you know, I think it's really cool that you can have someone whose brain is literally, like, at the top of the most intelligent people in the world. But you see him at a pub or you see him trying to talk to girls at the bar <laughs> or whatever. And he's just a relatable guy. Now, he might be familiar and totally understand the most complex and diverse uh, diverse concepts that exist in in our history of science but at the end of the day he can talk to you like he's a buddy that you that you you know shot the shit with for years and i think going from that to him being able to to really see that he's somebody that the world needs to step up and do something i think or well, i would hope that if we continue to tell the story if we're fortunate to do so people are going to going to want to see okay People are talking about how smart he was this whole season. He's been put in a place of power. What is he going to do with it? And I think that there's a few places you can go. I think, you know, you could just come up and be the hero right away. Or I think, you know, what's interesting in drama is a bit of conflict and a bit of obstacle and failures that he might not be able to immediately step into that role responsibly. So who really knows? I think it's, it's an exciting prospect, I think, for Saul. You know, you mentioned when you first got the role and you were – taking cracks at it, reading the material, and you found parts frustrating or a bit difficult to get into for the character. It, is there any like weird comparison to that of, you know, I mentioned Watchmen earlier when you're playing Will Reeves and sort of that internal um, silence that you mentioned, but at least for Will Reeves, you know, he took his anger out on like when he's crime fighting, he's just beating right. people to a pulp. He's getting his emotions out, his, his frustrations about his own identity. Did you find at least like some weird fit through a line between the two characters that helped you get to that place? Somewhat, yeah, I think, and I, I spoke about this before. I think that for whatever reason, I've 
gravitated to playing characters who are the underdogs in their story. I think people who who are walking down the street, the type of guy that you would never think twice about as being spectacular or being, you know, you know, anything special. If you're talking about Watchmen, I mean, the name of that episode was This Extraordinary Being. And I think before he became a crime fighter uh, in the superhero sense, superhero, uh, and him just being a police officer for all, you know, intent, he was very ordinary. Uh, and I think it's the same for Saul, at least when we first meet him. I mean, he's, of course, he has a stable job at Oxford University. You know, he's objectively smart, he's intelligent, but I think it has yet, I think we have yet to really see his power, his full potential. I think that his classmates, uh, his, his, his love, his best friends, the Oxford Five, know that he has a very, very powerful brain and he's able to dissect theories and, and understand things at a very high level and fairly quickly. Um, but I just think that, uh, that underdog aspect of it, I think we're still waiting to see what he can do. But it's interesting, you know, coming from, you know, his character doesn't come up until the second book anyway. So I had a lot mm -hmm. of freedom this, this first, or I would say a lot of comfort uh, in how I was playing him in the first season because mm -hmm. he didn't need to make any big splash. I mean, I was mm -hmm. there, I think in the truest sense, he was he was a supporting character and that he, like you mentioned in the beginning of the interview, he had, you know, a, a bit of a, an arc with, with Augie. He had, you know, his friendship with Will that was growing in the middle of the season. And then by the time we go to episode eight, he's established this bond with, with Dasha and, and Jess or Jim, excuse me. Um, so he's, he's just really been that, that buddy that's been a part of everyone else going through this traumatic experience that they've all gone through uh, respectively, but he's uh, getting ready to go to it, go through it himself. And, um, and I'm, I'm excited to see if he's, if he's built for it or not. Yeah, I mean, it, it's got to feel somewhat relieving, like you put in the work for this groundwork to stepping stones of the character. So that way, you know, let's be real, the show, people who watched you know, season two is <laughs> happening. Like, it, yeah, it's got to uh, be like when the time you come to set season two, you know, um, a weight off your shoulders that you can just go right into it and just be like, okay, I know where this is going. The, the, the switch is turned and you can lock in easily. Well, uh, well I, I mean, I've spoken to the showrunners. I mean, I, I, I bug them all the time. Uh, just because I like talking to them. I like picking their brains about things. And uh, I've heard loosely some ideas of what they want to what they want to do with Saul. Um, and it doesn't make me any less stressed or, or anxious because mm -hmm. I, I just approach the work. Um, I take it incredibly seriously. I'm the exact opposite of Saul. Um, and I know that and I've, I'm, I'm, I've ventured into the second book. So I know about the Dark Thor, excuse me, Dark Force Theory and everything like that. That's a very ambitious book as well. And so um, I think that I will be coming into set or pre-production if and when, I just have to say that, if and when uh, yeah. we, we make it happen. Uh, I, I plan to come into it with a bit more aggression as far as how I'm going to attack the role um, that I didn't need to have this, mm -hmm. this season. I just didn't need to. I think I, mm -hmm. they kind of pushed me to just play him as honestly and sincere as you can um, I don't need to walk into every scene and be like, I am a scientist. I am super smart, you know, pushing on my glasses and everything. It's not necessary. And I think people will relate to a guy that they that they can identify as like, oh, that's a buddy that I go party with on the weekends. But then when it's time to kind of crank it up and show why I've been appointing the wall facer, uh, I think that uh, that'll be the the performance that I'm waiting to to share with the audience for sure. Oh, look, I mean, you've had a great career like you leftovers when they see us watchmen um i guess gotta fan out for a second my favorite film of 2022 is babylon oh. okay <laughs> like so i i would like regret it i didn't bring it up to some degree i mean i'm just curious you know the film's reaction polarizing you know people either really love it uh mm -hmm. you know those calling themselves the babylon Hi, sure sure yeah. you've heard that before yeah yeah <laughs> or those who had very you know op opposite reactions to it when you were making it i know whenever you ask a so anyone on a film set when you're working you never know how it's going to turn out till it turns out were you always conscious of like this is going to be something that's divisive and really get like people talking or did you always expect were you surprised by like the reactions like when it came out I was never cognizant of it being polarizing. I don't think anybody who uh, is a part of the principal cast or or even, you know, the, the auxiliary cast, I don't believe that anybody cared. You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. think that, I mean, I can speak for myself and that's what I'll do. 
I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Damien Giselle. I mean, that's my brother. Love him to death. He's a brilliant mind. He's and he's a filmmaker that's not afraid to push the envelope. Um, as an artist, as an actor, that's what I like to say that I do all the time. Um, that's definitely how I approach the roles that I want. I want to do things that challenge me, uh, that push me to be as different from myself as I can. I don't know if I always succeed in that, but I try. Um, so to come into a project where we're all doing the best we can to, to just tell a really interesting and intense and racy and, and, and dark and funny and dramatic story. I mean, that's why you go to movies, man. I think I don't, mm -hmm. I, it, it is weird because I always, I'm always a skeptic when it comes to like, if there's a show or film, whatever, and everybody in the world is like, and this might be, I don't know, this might be the worst thing to say or whatever, but it's just like, you got to watch such and such. Like, I felt like mm -hmm. I heard a lot of shows during the pandemic. You have to watch right. this. It will change your life. And that could be true, but hearing it, I'm almost like, eh, I'll watch it later. Because I don't know, it's yeah. just something, the way somebody says it to me, it's like something being polarizing, that means that there are some really racy or really um, challenging ideas being presented. Yeah. And that's the type of filmmaking that pushes the genres forward. All of the genres, mm -hmm. sci-fi, horror, you know, rom-coms, romance, whatever. That's what pushes it forward is if you're telling stories in a different way that hasn't been done before. You could pay respect to the films of the past, but the only way we're going to continue to evolve in filmmaking and get people to continue to go to the theater to get new experiences is to have, is to have some racy shit. Excuse my language, yeah, I, but that's what it is. <laughs> it, it, it is true i mean that's i mean it feels like yeah, at the core that is what babylon was like I, I lived in florida at the time when it came out i i forced 10 people to go opening night i did not tell them what the movie was about i was just like we have to go see this because i was like excited I'm like look damien chazelle like brad pitt margot robbie diego calva who's amazing you like everyone in that film just like the production line is saying like is just fantastic and you know watching it and because i think we now live in an industry that's focused so much it feels in recent years more so towards the business sides and taking risks, the artistry yeah. of film. The yeah. film only came out two years ago, you know? Um, COVID, the strikes, it feels like we're not having industry people who want to go and jump to make films like this. And I mean, the film had like close to like 80 mil budget, didn't perform mm -hmm. as well as one would hope, sadly. Sure. Uh, do you think we'll get to a point again where studios want to go out and like back these auteur filmmakers like, like Chazelle. And I mean, I know Damien's got another film coming out next oh, yeah. year. Like I'm excited. I'm happy. You know, yeah. this people constantly were like, is he in director's jail? But you know, it, are, are you concerned as a performer that seeing filmmakers you either want to work with or respect are, are struggling to get projects that aren't, you know, being given budgets that they deserve? Well, as far as Damien goes, I'll break it up in pieces. I think his, his, high skill level is undeniable subjective it's objective mm. so there's no surprise that he's going to continue to work i mean yeah. <laughs> you objectively prove your you know your your talent once or twice like it's it doesn't go away you know and yeah. the only thing that you can do the biggest thing that you should respect about him is that he's willing to take risks and do things he mm -hmm. hasn't done before which he's done and i'm sure he's going to continue to do so he's going to be fine I don't believe in that yeah. jail bit. It could exist, but I don't know. He's still working. I, he's got a but, movie um, come out next year, the prison right. film. So, I'm so excited. Kind of, We're you good. know what I mean? Yeah. But, pe but you're right. People do come up with those type of, that's just good uh, headline for, mm -hmm. for the magazines and stuff like that. He, Hollywood does it, whatever. But as far as what you're saying about, you know, that type of filmmaking, I think the pandemic and the strike and everything that you mentioned did play a part in how movies get made. I think it's easier to, to adapt and bring known IP to the screen, uh, but the same way that a new challenging type of film can fail at the box office, some of the popular IPs have failed as well. They've burned a shit ton of money as well. So it can't, it's, for me, I, that's not my side of the, of the industry. You know, the executive, the studio, I can't, yeah. I'm not in those rooms, you know? So I don't know what the algorithm, algorithm is, what they do to, to make things happen. I can't really speak on it in that way, but as an as a, as a avid moviegoer, and mm -hmm. a, a lover of film and television and just good storytelling. I think we have to continue to take risks. Uh, talking to some buddies who are writers and, and directors, they feel, I don't know how I feel about it, but just listening to it, I'm wondering how valid it is. They feel like Hollywood is gonna have to have like a master reset at some point to really get into mm -hmm. like, I miss those days, like the golden era of filmmaking, you know, like the years of Godfather and on the waterfront, those type of films where 
there were all kinds of stories. This was like a story, you know, on the waterfront about a boxer who worked on the mm-hmm. docks. Like, how did that happen to me? Like, what's the I story there? I used to there? be a like, contender. I used to be yeah, somebody. I used to be somebody. I used to be, you know, like, it's just like, those movies were getting made all the time. But it's refreshing that we have movies like American Fiction and, you know, all these type yes. of different, all these type of different new stories that are past lives, all these new films that are coming out that are telling every story doesn't have to have a billion things going on. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's, it's the simplest idea. And if it's executed well and the characters are interesting and the pacing is great, like that's all we can ask for, for new things. And so I just think, yeah. I don't know, I, I would love for them to take more risks. I think that people are starting to, but it's only like mm-hmm. a movie or two a year. And I think yeah. to really get people going to the movies again, we got to take a little bit more swings at bat. I mean, but that's yeah. easy to say. I'm not the one that's yeah buddy you know <laughs> so yeah no I, I my opinion let everybody know in the recordings my yeah. opinion i don't know if that's <laughs> you know the right way to go i just act yes yeah, <laughs> yeah no i totally agree i mean court jefferson american fiction we mentioned uh watchman alum he, his speech was right let's fund these smaller films get most of them out and let's take risks people um yeah. jovan thank you so much this was a delightful conversation Everyone check out Three Body Problem. Uh, if you have anything else that you want to promote or we're working on next, you go nuts. Oh right man, now. I got to I got to let Three Body, you know, live in this live in this interview. Let it, here. Let's but let it take up I, the, yeah, let it take up the headlines. Yeah, man, I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of all of my castmates. I'm sorry my dog's barking in the back. Uh, all my castmates, everybody worked really hard. Dad, you know, Dan, Alex and, and David really really uh, appreciate being a part of the project with these guys and hopefully we get to give you guys more. And Gio, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, thank you.